Everybody. Welcome to the November 20th, 2015 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on the official opening of the Westin Hotel at Denver International Airport. Between the design of the building and its placement in front of the iconic airport, it's certainly become a topic of conversation in Denver. Pete Cahoon from Westward. So uh, we've been doing the poll around here. Uh, what's your official take? Whale tail, ship, wings, other? Mustache. Ah. And it is November, so it's mustache month. Makes so sense. I think it's appropriate that it opened. Great that we've got the hotel out there finally. We've got another thing to talk about besides the devil horse. You know, love it or hate the architecture. And come April, we will be able to take light rail all the way to Union Station. The press release announces it's only going to be 37 minutes to get to Union Station. And then it's going to be another 37 minutes to walk from the light rail station into the station because they're sitting so far away. But there's a lot of planning we can talk about. A lot of healthy walking at DIA. Mike Krause uh, coming to us from the Independence Institute. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the, the big opening of the hotel, it seemed that uh, it actually opened on time, which we're not used to seeing in a big uh, airport atmosphere. What do you think? Well, it may have opened on time, but that doesn't mean it opened on budget. And uh, if this is actually a great example of, of government, the problem with government playing real estate developer, in that when the private sector goes dramatically over budget on a project like this, they either have to go back and refinance, find new investors, or fold up and sell it at a fire sale. Not, uh, not Denver, they can just raise airport fees. And so this is a beautiful example of why uh, government should not be in the landlord or real estate development business. Ben Tate, attorney with QTAC Rock, uh, and a former long-time long state lawmaker. Uh, does this become a centerpiece for what hopefully will become, I guess, for uh, hopefully for Mayor Hancock in the Metropolis, or is that further away from the airport? Is this, this is a, a big deal? Yeah, I think it's a big deal for a couple of reasons. Um, first, I agree with Patty. Of, of course, it's a mustache. Everybody who looks at it knows that. <laughs> um, it, and it is a centerpiece for him. Um, and, and just as Mayor Webb completed DIA after Mayor Pena started it, this was was Mayor Hancock completing something that someone else sort of started, which is sort of the normal order of things. It's how things should be. So it is huge for him. Um, I don't know if it necessarily plays into the Aerotropolis piece just because it is situate right there by the terminal and some of the other development is going to be further away, but it shows that there's at least the ability and an interest in getting some development on on site. And who knows, maybe another day Mike and I can debate whether government ought to be in the real estate development business. <laughs> there are times when it makes sense. You look at the downtown web building, you look at the Justice Center that, that, that Denver's built, um, you look at some of the other cultural amenities, you can make them work. You just have to figure out what your horizon is in terms of when you consider them viable or not. And Ben Gill, public affairs consultant, wrap it up for us. Well, another you know controversial image at the airport. This one obscuring maybe the only non-controversial image: the beautiful teepees and tents of the airport terminal itself. So I'm not a huge fan of the obscuring of that. I think it's really exciting for all Colorado residents and metro area residents to be able to take the train out there. So I think more than the airport, we're waiting on the train. It makes sense to me. I'm very excited about the train myself. Governor Hickenlooper announced this week that he will not join the 24 states that are working to deny Syrian refugees in their states. He stated that Colorado will work with the federal government and Homeland Security to vet any individuals to maintain safety in the state. Now, Patty, we'll do another round about how other Republicans responded to Governor Hickenlooper, but let's start with his stance. Uh, were you surprised he went out on this political limb? Well, it's not that. It's a crowded political limb. Half the states are still saying they will accept refugees. I don't think it's a surprise at all when you think about it. This is still a country that was founded on immigration. I can absolutely see ramping up security, uh, definitely taking closer looks at the people coming in. But let's remember where terrorism has already happened here. You have homegrown terrorists like Terry Nichols and Tim McVeigh. Um, you know, you, you didn't have to stop immigration to uh, stop that. I mean, it was not going to happen. You have girls who are getting recruited via the internet who are in suburban Denver. You know, those are not people coming from Syria. Those are not refugees. Those are people who are here. In Europe, you see people who had been were raised in Belgium. They were not coming from Syria. They were not coming from the Middle East. And they, too, have been um, 
converted. So you just have to watch everywhere. But I don't think shutting our borders and defying what really founded this country is the solution. You just have to be more careful. Mike, this was an, is an international story that quickly became national and then local right here at our state. People ask themselves, oh gosh, this are, here's this tragedy happening in France and this ongoing tragedy happening in Syria. Oh, wait a second, what, is, what does it mean if it's hitting our own neighborhood, our own state? What did you think of the stance Governor Hickler took? Well, I, I frankly wasn't surprised um, uh, over the the governor, as of late, has has been uh, aligning himself with the administration on quite a few things, like the EPA's clean power plan, and now he wants to push back on Cynthia Kaufman for suing over it. Uh, although it's interesting that he he makes the case. One of the things he said when he was being interviewed uh, was that, well, this is I, I have to follow federal law. And I said, well, actually, interestingly enough, while it doesn't look like any of these states who are taking the stance actually have the ability to deny entry uh, to any of these uh, refugees, this is a federal issue. Uh, they under, are under no obligation to actually cooperate in it. And so he's acting as though, well, I have no choice in the matter. Uh, if he wants to make his case, then make the case. Don't just claim, hey, the federal government says we got to do it. We got to do it. That's not so. Uh, they can't stop it. That doesn't mean states have to cooperate. And you would think that uh, the Obama administration would want to sit down with all these governors and talk about their concerns because he would want the cooperation of the states, including, by the way, the local tax dollars that will be expended on this. Penn, you are our esteemed uh, attorney at the table today, so I don't know about the, the legal uh, points uh, that, that Mike is making about what states can or can't do. It seemed odd that a state can decide no on a refugee thing, so that, that I, I t understand where, where Mike's coming from there. What are some of the other legal ramifications to uh, Hickelooper's stance? Uh, frankly, I don't know. Um, and, and in this context, states can do practically whatever they want to do in terms of whether they cooperate or not or whether they implement the president's directive. The, the question then is, what's the remedy of the federal government to deal with a state that doesn't participate a, 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 and, and cooperate? And I suspect, as a practical matter, it's none. You're not going to go after half of the states. I think the governor's decision is the right one, as I think, think the president's is. I, as a country, I think we're torn philosophically between whether we want to engage in the global community or whether we want to be isolationist. And I would think the circumstances in France teach us we can't be isolationist because one way or another, we're going to have to deal with these issues either on someone else's soil or on our own soil because Patty raises the appropriate point. We've had homegrown terrorists before, and you can think of smaller examples of that. Some people may call them just gun violence incidents, but we've got some issues domestically we have to deal with that's not related to immigration. If you want to lead in the world, it's one thing to want to lead based on military might, but military might isn't always the most persuasive way to get people around to your way of thinking. And so sometimes you have to use other tools uh, in the toolkit, so to speak, other than just military might to persuade people to come along and work with you on the next issue, even if they disagree with you on this issue. So I think the president's doing the right thing. We've got to verify, we've got to use all of the resources in our capacity. But from what I've seen, most of these refugees are women and kids. And I don't know if they pose much of a threat to our safety. Ben, do you think Governor Hickelooper's decision on this issue is going to impact other Democrats locally, whether they be federal representatives or even just within the state legislature? I don't think so. I think most Democrats seem to be relatively in alignment on this. You know, it's interesting watching all this play out, and the governor talks about we'll make sure we'll work with the federal government to make sure that uh, we're vetting the people. You know, the United States spends $18 billion, with a B, a year on immigration-related security. So it strikes me that we're already doing a lot in that vein. We are a country of immigrants, and to start blocking access to people that are legitimate refugees is not only unpatriotic, but immoral. So I think the governor's stance is completely appropriate. I think it's an, a, a total acknowledgement of the history of the country. And I think you know the people that are sort of railing against it really ought to look in the mirrors and ask themselves where they came from. And we can look to Paris, to France, where they have, you know, the, the uh, president of France has said, we're going to continue to allow the 50 or 150,000 Syrian uh, refugees to come into our country. So I think that we have no excuse for trying to block people who have a legitimate uh, humanitarian concern.
Well, speaking of railing against it, in response to Governor Hickenlooper's response in the Syrian refugee crisis, several Colorado Republicans spoke in opposition. Representative Mike Kaufman stated that we have no way of conducting thorough background checks, while Representative Scott Tipton called the plan naive and irresponsible. Mike, um, there were other Republicans that came out and said this. These were just some of the high-profile federal representatives. Um, what do you think of the Republican response? Well, it's not just a Republican response, actually. If you look uh, the other day, uh, enough Democrats joined Republicans in the Congress to, to vote on a veto-proof pause on this, not, in, not to stop it, to pause it, including Representative Jared Polis uh, from Boulder. And so it, it, it was clearly something that at first fell neatly along partisan lines, right? But then we're seeing that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and by the way, um, uh, from the pres from the executive branch's perspective, you, if this is just another example of President Obama really acting like an imperial presidency and an imperial executive branch. Basically, anyone who disagrees with him on this was a xenophobic uh, and or and or racist. And then all of a sudden, uh, forty something Democrats in the Congress uh, cross the aisle to say, "Look, let's just stop and think about it." So it's not a Republican response, not anymore. Penn, I mean, obviously we've had the response from the federal Congress, but uh, we've seen also that it becomes a local issue. Do you think it's going to become partisan, or is it uh, truly going to be a bipartisan issue? Uh, you know, with the exception of the of the vote in the House, I think it is a partisan issue. We talked about uh, the 24 states that had voted to not go along with um, the president's uh, directive. All but one of them are Republican governors. Uh, it, that's not a coincidence. This is falling along partisan lines. Um, it is quite possible that as the conversation continues and more details come out about how the verification and reporting and everything else will work, um, hopefully the, the debate will descend where it needs to descend into the policy and into the practical conversation about, you know, how does this work? Is it workable? Um, and, and if we get to a point where it's not workable, I suspect the president will rethink this. Uh, I think what he's given us now is his initial reaction and his initial thought about how we as a country ought to respond to this. But I think it is partisan at this point, but I think there's the possibility that that reaction may change over time. Ben, we're beginning that hyperactive election season, not only with the presidential races, but it's going to become big here in Colorado with our Senate race, things like that. Does this have enough legs to become a political partisan issue for the 2016 election? I think so, because I think security has remained a, a prominent issue uh, both locally and nationally when we talk about the national body politic. You know, and it's interesting to hear some of these points from, from folks on either side of the aisle, uh, you know, talking about the safety and security of it. You know, there was an interesting piece in the New York Times that detailed how, what's the number, 2,300 plus uh, folks who are on the terrorism watch list have been able to go and purchase weapons and firearms in our country because the NRA and conservative forces have worked hard to keep that loophole open. And yet, on the same coin, they're, they're saying we can't have these people even coming into the country. So I, I think it will remain an issue. There's so many things that can come out of it. Uh, there's no way it will die down. And uh, certainly with our you know, unique history in Colorado, with episodic episodes of gun violence, and then our national history of, of uh, recent history of having attacks, it, it won't go away. And I think that we'll see a lot of different permutations and issues come out of it. Somewhere David Coppola's longing to rebut, but he's, on a, he's at a family wedding right this oh, that week, so that's okay. He'll, he'll, be, he'll be back next time. Patty, wrap it up for us. Well, it, it's, it's fascinating to think about DIA, which is just celebrated its 20th year and was designed before 2011, I mean 2000, the 9-11, sorry, but it's incredible the difference in security, how that airport would have been designed differently. They're talking about redoing the terminal, which obviously was designed before you had to have more security. Used to be you just had the little magic um, wand go over mm -hmm. things because they didn't want you to hijack the plane for Cuba. But so we're all rethinking security and it is absolutely going to affect us as we think about who would be the next president because you think how would they respond in something like this? Would they actually know where these countries are? Um, what would they do if they suddenly heard about a hotel being taken over as we did this morning? So it is going to affect the and it's really going to make people less likely to go on a flyer with someone who's an untried politician, I think. Mm -hmm. the, a, a Quinnipiac poll of Colorado Republican voters revealed that 25% currently support ben, Dr. Ben Carson. The results released on Wednesday show Marco Rubio, Donald Trump, and Ted Cruz all fighting for second place, while Carly Fiorina, Rand Paul, and Jeb Bush came in a distant third. 
Uh, Penn, uh, we love talking about polls like this, but we are uh, still uh, a little under a year from the actual general election. Uh, Colorado has given up its really official Republican uh, primary caucus, primary, whatever it is. Their, their straw poll is not going to matter in uh, next year. So it's not that this, this is going to predict what Colorado is going to do. But all that being said, we love talking about this. What do you pull out from these poll results? Sure. I, I, I think it shows a couple of things. We have talked for quite a while now, a number of years, about how Colorado has evolved into a purple state. We're depending on the candidate, the issue, and some of the, the broader context. Republicans can win, Democrats can win. And I think the poll reflects that. I think among the Republican candidates, Ben Carson at this point has probably been successful in the minds of, I think, I would say most moderate or what I call traditional Republicans, is not being, uh, as being the least extreme, um, the least overbearing, the least offensive, the least incompetent, the least bumbling, and the least contradictory. So he gets the most votes in support. I think Trump is too loud. I think Rubio and Cruz and um, and, and, and even Bush are, are, are probably too far to one extreme or another on particular issues for the vast majority of mainstream Colorado Republicans. And I think the Republican Party in our state has worked hard over the years. First, it was the captive of the moral majority and sort of the faith community. Now it's been struggling to fight back against the Tea Party because the Tea Party has been, been running some pretty outrageous candidates that even the Colorado Republican Party doesn't really want to support. And so this doesn't surprise me at all that Carson is in this position and that Trump is sort of back down with Rubio and Cruz, because I think the Coloradans aren't that extreme. And we'll see if this continues. And you're right, part of this is academic, because two-thirds of these people aren't going to be around come May anyway, so. Uh, ben, um, these poll results that we're seeing from this poll seem to mirror a lot of the national trending. Uh, Dr. Carson's having uh, a much better November than Donald Trump is, things like that. But Colorado likes to uh, uh, tweak national standards. We yeah. like to be just the, the outsider, at, but usually a little bit close to the election. Do you think Colorado uh, Republicans, if they were to have a vote that counted in the primary season, would buck a national trend? It's so hard to say because I think what you're seeing nationally is that there's a, there's a huge fracturing that's taken place in the Republican Party and all of these guys have their own little bases of support. I think here in Colorado, part of the reason that you're seeing Dr. Carson see so much support is because we do have a really substantial evangelical population. And even though he's perhaps less bombastic than some of the other candidates, he's uh, pretty fervent about his uh, religion and, and is unafraid to say so. So I think that that has created a, a lot of appeal. You know, to me, when I looked at the poll, the, the big takeaway that I got is that they have a generic uh, Republican beating Hillary Clinton by 10 points. And, and so the thing that I'd like to say about this is that any Quinnipiac poll done in Colorado should be taken with a huge grain of salt. If they were even close to being accurate, you know, we would have Governor Beaupre today probably running as fast as he can to jump on the you know, Republican hysteria bandwagon saying we can't have orphans come uh, out of Syria getting away from ISIS, but we can totally sell guns to people on the terrorist watch list. So, you know, I think that this is a total non-starter and should be, frankly, dismissed out of hand. <laughs> you do get that? the David Coppola award of bringing back a topic two and topic three. Sure. Well done. Uh, Patty, is the, um, <laughs> do you think that Ben Carson will continue to uh, see this kind of popularity in Colorado? I think what happened in Paris last week is going to change how people feel about Ben Carson because depending on, I mean, you might want to bomb the hell out of ISIS, which is of course what Donald Trump is saying. You might want to take an approach some of the other Republican candidates are doing. But of all of them, he of course has the least, truly the least amount of experience in thinking about foreign affairs. And you know, I guess maybe he'd go to China. That's the whole issue. You know, he's got the China involved, China involved in the Middle East. He would might be focusing on the wrong thing. So I think as people really weigh, interesting, smart man, religious against his experience, I think it will shift because they're going to think, who do we want to be in the White House if and when terrorism hits this country? Mike, if Colorado Republicans vote counted in the primary season, um, who do you think they wins it in the spring? Well, I, I will tell you that, and Ben is right, Ben Carson has a strong appeal to culturally conservative and evangelical uh, conservatives and Republicans. He really does. He has a strong base. In fact, you saw that when during the debate in Boulder. He packed the House over at 
Colorado Christian University at a Centennial Institute event, and they really loved him over there. Um, I, I actually think, I, I don't know who would win the, that debate, because you remember Colorado primary voters, uh, Republican primary voters tend to uh, elect candidates who are, don't do particularly well in general elections. Um, but um, I, I've noticed that uh, over the last couple of weeks, and one of the reasons I think Ben Carson got a bump in this latest poll was that he has been slapped around uh, hard by the national press over some, some misstatements and some claims he's made and has uh, really seen some scrutiny that you don't usually see in a, uh, just before we even have a candidate, before he's even the candidate. For, uh, certainly that you wouldn't have seen a, uh, so for example, um, a lot of people have said, well, would you, Barack Obama's grades were never examined this closely, even though a lot of people had questions about him, but also you have Ben Carson, all of a sudden he's being scrutinized. So I think you're actually seeing a bump because a lot of Republican voters are looking at what they consider to be the liberal mainstream hmm. press, slapping around a guy they like. Uh, and so he's getting a bump out of that. I have a hard time seeing it stick around. And by the way, if you want to, I mean, if you want to see Donald Trump, uh, you know, if you want to start getting used to saying President Trump, let's just, you know, see uh, another attack uh, somewhere closer to American shores. And uh, he, he seems to be, uh, he seems to have grabbed that microphone. He grabbed that microphone, but anytime a presidential candidate says the answer to something like this is closing down mosques and forgetting the entire fact that we have a First Amendment, it's got to lose a little bit of credibility, but maybe Eventually. it's just me. Maybe it's just me. Let's get a quick take on this last one. Colorado officials released a first-of-its-kind water plan this week that is aimed at conservation efforts for the state. The $20 billion plan addresses drought projections aligned with our growing population and plans to address dams and reservoirs. Uh, ben, your short take. This is a big deal just because they did it. You know, I've been asking my dad about water law and water rights in this state since I was a little boy. I still really don't have a great grip on it other than what we have here is so critical for the rest of the West. So this was a, a landmark sort of move. It has no teeth, but I think a lot of good ideas and we'll see what comes, but certainly a really important document as we continue to have explosive growth, not just in Colorado, but in the West in general. And we have to figure out how to manage a finite resource. Patty, can, can this go from plan to reality? Well, certainly parts of it will be adopted, and Hickenlooper was smart to push it because we have huge growth in Colorado, but we do not have a growth in the amount of water we have unless we play anti-refugee and just shut it down and don't let any go to California, which maybe is where we should wor worry about our borders. But it is time to think about it. It's time to think about conserving, time to think about what we can do with scarce resources and more people. Mike, your quick take. The Colorado Constitution you know, says that water is a, is a public resource, but the Colorado Constitution also includes uh, uh, private ownership of water rights for prior appropriation. In fact, we're one of the, I think we're the only state left with a prior appropriation water doctrine. And yes, water law is an extremely difficult, convoluted, and goes, dates back well before statehood. Uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, and one of the great fears that we should have is that we should be very careful not to inadvertently run from our prior appropriation doctrine, which actually prices a scarce resource at a market rate to a, to a public trust doctrine like California has begun adopting, where the government's basically in charge of water, and the next thing you know you have a drought on your hands. Uh, so we should uh, hold on to our public appropriation doctrine, and thankfully it would take a constitutional amendment to change that. Pan, wrap it up for us. You know, important important step along the continuum of steps. Um, smaller water providers and other water utilities have been striking agreements over the past several years to work cooperatively uh, to come up with some plans uh, for the future of Colorado. The reality is, is we're growing too fast. We don't have enough water for the people who are here now versus those who are coming. We need to be smart about this, and we're in this as a state because the reality is our water rights are tied to the downstream users, California. Nevada, Arizona, and they have first call on some of this water. So if we don't get it figured out as a state, we're in a world of hurt. And this is at least a good first start. Our favorite part of the show, Disgrace of the Week. Patty, start us off. Uh, the people who have taken patriotism way too far, they vandalized ISIS Bookshop, which is an old <laughs> metaphysical bookshop that's at least three decades old. They're attacking girls who are named ISIS after the Egyptian goddess. Let's all calm down a little and at least pick the right targets. Exactly. Mike. Uh, last Monday, the 16th, the Environmental Protection Agency had a hearing on its clean power plan to jack up everybody's electricity rates in its district, district 8 headquarters. And right outside of the <laughs> hearing room was a sign-up table for the Sierra Club. Uh, let's just go ahead and say that the political left would be outraged if, say, the NRA had a sign-up table at a hearing at the Department of Education to arm teachers in schools. Uh, so it, it's a bit of an outrage, but at least, at least let's give the EPA props for go ahead and coming out of the closet as the regulatory arm 
of the anti-fossil fuels environmental movement. Ben. Um, Patty's point, but then a, a point beyond. Uh, it, it's a disgrace that in this country we're still dealing with the inability to, to isolate that this terrorism situation cannot be defined just based on race or color or ethnicity or national origin or where you live. This is something broader than that, and we, we do. We need to take a deep breath and calm down because the hysteria is beginning to ramp up, and as a country, we're better than that. Ben. Well, not to pile on, but the 24 states that are working to deny refugees, it's shameful and uh, unpatriotic, immoral, what have you. Uh, shame on them. We need to acknowledge our own history, and we need to be part of the world and, and help people that need it. Let's say something nice about somebody rather quickly. We have many reasons to give thanks this year, and one of them are the great generosity of people in Denver, including the Squeaky Bean, which is taking over for the old Rosalinda's free Thanksgiving Day feast. I love it. I'm going to say uh, something nice about Wheat Ridge, Colorado voters. This goes back to November 3rd, who uh, passed Measure 300, which not a lot of people knew about, and which requires a vote of the people for any corporate welfare packages of tax increment financing to private corporations of over $2.5 million. A great start towards taking back control of their local government. A shout out to my hometown, Go Farmers. Yeah. Penn. Uh, to all of the restaurants um, that are providing free meals to people this, ho this Thanksgiving season, to, to the folks who still continue the tradition of Daddy Bruce with some of the turkey mm -hmm. and meal giveaways, um, we should all be thankful, quite frankly, for one another. Here, here, totally agree. Ben. Also, in keeping with the spirit of the holiday season, um, I want to acknowledge the Colorado History Museum. They have started an exhibit highlighting uh, homelessness in Colorado and the history of it. And it's a difficult and important issue that uh, we talk about growth in, in our area, and we're seeing growth in the homeless population. So uh, an important conversation to have, and thank you to them for forcing it. Here, here. That is all the time we have tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Tune in Sunday night at 7 p.m. for a very special presentation of Dog by Dog, an important documentary about the underbelly of the puppy mill system in the, in the United States. Also, our annual tradition is back. Tune in next Friday for our special Colorado Inside Out Time Machine Marathon starting at 7 p.m. Of course, our 1973 kicks it off. You will not want to miss it if just for my wig. Remember that you can catch any part of CIO or the show post game online and be sure to check out the CIO podcast on iTunes. For everyone here at Channel 12, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thanks for watching. Good night. I'll be directing Colorado Inside Out today. I'm not a director, but I play one on TV. Uh, the main thing I'll be doing is watching these monitors up here and uh, trying to determine when to go to the talent who will be talking. I'll be working mostly with uh, Tyler, which is our technical director, so he's the one who's pushing all the buttons. He's a big button pusher. Hello, my name is Tyler. I'm the technical director here. It's called a switcher. I basically Listen to the director and take the cuts, take the camera cuts as the director calls it. Ready, camera two, take. So each button here corresponds with a uh, camera out in the studio. Camera one, camera two, camera three, camera four. For CIO, we use four cameras. This bottom row is for preview, so before taking a cut, we pull it up in preview. The, the preview monitor is to the left there. And as soon as we want to take it into program, which is what's actually going to tape, what's being recorded, we, uh, the director will say, all right, take camera one. I also wait for the director's cue to bring in IDs, um, sort of the lower third, tells us who the guest is. Also, um, loading clips, roll-ins, which includes the open, and it all changes show to show, so, which is fine. So I basically just, I take orders from the director, <laughs> as we all do.
and we really enjoy it. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> is, this a, is this working? Everyone else is doing their own job and contributing, and the director just kind of is the focal point. Mic the cue in five, four, three, two, one. Fade mic cue. The director's main job is just to kind of funnel all that and bring it all together. Roll credits. X bang down. Set black and dissolve. Audio out. Welcome to the November 20th edition of Colorado Inside Out Post Game, a special web exclusive production here on Channel 12. Let's get a quick take on Denver International Airport celebrating its 20th year anniversary this year and all the variety of things happening into airport security, the hotel, everything opening up, uh, especially this week and coming on a very busy travel week. Patty Calhoun from Westward, we have a hotel opening, we have increased security concerns, and, a ho and an airport with its very well uh, uh, documented story of the last 20 years. Take your pick. Well, it's fascinating to think about and how long we've had DIA, that it's been 20 years, and of course it was in the works for 10 years before then. And when you look at the design of DIA, uh, it reminds you of what the world was like back in 1995 as opposed to now with the concerns about terrorism. You also are reminded that we were supposed to have a hotel all along, and it took 20 years to get it built, and we got this beautiful mustachio design. But the, my next concern is what's going to happen to the terminal, the Jeppesen Terminal. Under that great tent roof, that great big open space, there's talk about moving security away from the floor there. And you would have to go through security before you get there. There currently are RFPs out from DIA. They're looking for plans. So you would essentially turn that terminal, which is a beautiful space, into the world's largest shopping mall only for those who have already passed through security, which I think would be a real waste of that at the airport. So we have a lot of issues coming up. We'll have to see if light rail is going to work. We're going to have to see if people are going to be able to cart their suitcases all the way from the light rail stop to Union Station because we were too cheap to build a moving sidewalk. We've got some things still to see how they work out. Someone's got like a, an airport segway business out there. They make millions. Uh, Mike Krause, the Independence Institute. Uh, 
DAA has done a I think a pretty good job of, of meeting some pretty high expectations, and it's it's a I think in Denver we take it for granted. It's a very busy airport. I just did some flying nationally and internationally. DIA is a very busy airport. Do you think what do you, what do you think our reputation is nationally for having to do with a lot of different things? Well, I think that. Look, DIA is, a lot of people might not realize just how busy DIA has become. And in fact, if you go look at airport statistics, DIA is indeed an extremely busy airport and, uh, and also a big international hub now, bigger and bigger. Uh, although it, it's a frustrating airport because it's so beautiful, and it's so beautiful inside, especially in the Jefferson Terminal. But then the, they have these bizarre design uh, issues in there that go back, to, almost like a uh, they were designed after like it was a Soviet uh, Russia architect where you pile off people off of four train cars into one narrow staircase going up uh, and you can't walk between term you know from uh, the main terminal to the other terminal so it was almost like there was a central planner involved somewhere <laughs> and they really missed an opportunity to help people to flow it's not an easy airport to flow through but it's still a beautiful airport and uh, uh, for all of its uh, ups and downs and its bumps and bruises it's uh, it's it's nice to have it's a good point you make about the lack of walking between the different concourses because I think it's Cincinnati. I was there for a layover and it was the same design, but you could walk through it and it made all the difference made because all the difference it, the world. It, if it the was, train breaks down, you're just out of luck. Exactly. So. Penn Tate, uh, attorney with, uh, with QTAC Rock and also a longtime state lawmaker. Uh, DIA has had a, uh, overcome a lot of uh, bumps and bruises between luggage systems and everything else and handle the real transformation of airport security. And I have to give it um, some credit because I, flying internationally, I was in the Frankfurt Airport. We had to go through uh, security. I was randomly picked out. I think I, I had a pretty good beer going on, so uh, I don't know it was that, that random. But for extra screening, well, I thought, I don't know what to expect. The extra screening was the little x-ray booth that they have for everybody at DIA. Something myself, you know, the extra effort internationally, at least in the Frankfurt Airport, was what everybody got at DIA. So it made me think we're, we're doing some things right. When you look at DIA, what are your impressions, of, especially on this 20th anniversary? Well, you know, when I look at DIA, the first thing that comes to mind to me is, is the people of the state of Colorado ought to be congratulated. We went through an election to, to get the thing built. We just got a successful election to modify the original intergovernmental agreement to allow more development. And so it really stands, I think, as a testament to the power of collective action in our state and moving forward to do things that's in the best interest of the state overall. That being said, it's a beautiful airport. Um, and when you look at it, uh, I think it has stood the test of time. People were very critical about how much it cost on the front end. But quite frankly, right now, DIA costs less for an entire airport than some cities are building to expand or modernize their airports. And ours is bigger still and can still be expanded. So it was masterful planning. It was well done. It's been well executed and it's been well run. Does it have its challenges? Does it have a few pimples that need to be fixed? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think when it's all said and done, it's worked well for the community. It's worked well for Colorado travelers. Uh, it's been a boon to our economy, and it's probably going to continue to be a gem for years to come. Ben Gill, public affairs consultant. When you look at Denver International Airport, like, like uh, uh, Penn eloquently said, it, it's had its issues, but uh, overall, I think it's, it's been a, a moment of pride, a point of pride for people in Colorado. Now, especially since we'll have a train getting to downtown, that, that'll, that, be that, that, that'll be the key. Uh, what are your impressions of it, especially in, on, a, on a busy travel weekend like this one? You know, I've traveled a lot uh, internationally and around the holidays also, and I actually, for a, a domestic airport in this country, uh, DIA is remarkably easy to deal with. Uh, when you compare it to, say, uh, Atlanta or O'Hare in Chicago or some of the other big airports around the country, DIA is so easy to navigate in spite of the fact that it is difficult to get from terminal to terminal unless you're taking the bridge over to Terminal A. So I think from that standpoint, it's worked beautifully. Um, I think, yeah, it's 20 years old, but it's, it's easy to forget that it's also still the newest uh, international airport in this country. Um, I think in terms of the economic value. It's unquestioned. It is the largest economic engine in the entire region, not just the state of Colorado, but the entire western mountain region. It's a big deal. This, uh, you know, the redesign of the Jefferson Terminal will also be a big deal. There are a lot of uh, moving sort of targets there. Certainly security is a real concern. 
that beautiful space uh, is something that I hope that they can find a way to continue to allow basic public access to and don't put it behind the security line. There's, uh, you know, the price tag that I've seen around it is about $200 million to redesign it. And that includes, you know, potentially moving where the train lets on and off. And it, there's going to be a lot of fighting about that. I know one concern that I've heard from some uh, city council members here in Denver is that the train uh, with a potential redesign will require a longer walk from the train to meet your family or your friends who's picking you up. And uh, I, I think a lot of travelers don't really want to wait longer to see their fa uh, friends or family. Uh, that's a real concern. All the businesses that are now in the Jefferson Terminal are, most of them are the oldest businesses at DIA. The Burger King there, for example, was there actually before the airport opened. All of those contracts will come up. And, you know, that's an important thing to think about also because all of those business owners are small business owners who are local and in many cases minority owned. So a lot of questions are surrounding how it will be done and if it will be done right. Frankly, from my perspective, if you look at some of the other decisions that have been made at the airport, I'm frankly not terribly confident that they'll make the right decisions. And it's not to say that they've made egregiously bad decisions, but talk about the hotel. It totally obscures the tents and the beauty of the airport. It, it's terrible from that perspective. It's a cool looking building, fine, but it blocks the cooler looking building. So hopefully we can get our uh, priorities straight and do a little bit better job inside the terminal. That is all the time we have for Colorado Inside Out Post Game this week. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you think. For everyone here at CPT12.org, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thanks for watching.